In this episode of A Blockchain Lawyer, I speak with David Safe on blockchain in the maritime economy and compliant programming. Welcome to The Blockchain Lawyer, a podcast on technology and law. Dennis Hilleman is an accomplished lawyer with over 13 years of experience and a passion for creating a better future through blockchain technology, cryptocurrency, and other disruptive innovations. All statements expressed in this podcast are the opinions of the host and his guests only and are in no way legal or financial advice. And now, here is your host, Dennis. Hi, everyone. This is Dennis speaking. Before we head into the interview, I want to recommend to you to join the Blockchain Lawyers Network. It's a social network running on money networks where lawyers, entrepreneurs, and blockchainers from all over the world connect and discuss blockchain and regulation. We discuss matters like blockchain and privacy or the regulation of cryptocurrencies. I'd love for you to join. It's totally free. If you want to join, go to www.blockchainlawyersnetwork.com. That's one word, blockchainlawyersnetwork.com. Or you can also reach the network via the blockchain.lawyer. So either www.blockchainlawyersnetwork.com or the blockchain.lawyer. Happy to see you there. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new episode of The Blockchain Lawyer. My name is Dennis Silliman, and I'm here today with David Safe. Hello, David. Hi, Dennis. Hi. Cool that you made it on The Blockchain Lawyer podcast. Um, David, tell us a little about yourself. Who are you and why did you come on this podcast today? Yeah, thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much for your invitation. I'm really happy to be here today. Uh, since it's, uh, since I am from Hamburg and you are from Hamburg, it's a short way. <laughs> yes, yes, we're absolutely from the, uh, from Hamburg both, but we're not fans of the same football club. We just talked about that again. So we will not dive into that topic, but just blockchain. <laughs> There's only one football club. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. Well, I'm here today because I'm working uh, in blockchain and law. So mm -hmm. I'm a lawyer myself. I work from the University of Oldenburg, so not in Hamburg, but in up in the northwest of Germany, next to Bremen, like 160 kilometers from here. And I studied law in Hamburg, then finished my studies and went to a German law firm in Bremen, where I worked in maritime law, specifically in all the marine casualty issues. Mm -hmm. And then I tried to prepare a PhD thesis actually on blockchain in maritime. Wow, cool. Yeah. What, what was the subject? Yeah, the specific subject is how to digitize the traditional bill of lading with blockchain technology. Cool. And um, so probably not everyone is accustomed to maritime, uh, maritime terms. What is the bill of lading? Yeah, the bill of lading is still one of the most important documents of maritime trade. It is necessary for like guaranteeing that the exporting party really did transfer the goods mm -hmm. to the importing party. It's something like a receipt that the shipper or the carrier issues when the good is taken over onto the boat. Mm -hmm. It's easy as that. Okay. And this is this document is still necessary to be printed out in paper, mm -hmm. signed by hand and then sent to the parties in a paper way. And, and from my understanding, um, the origins of a document go back to the Middle Ages, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, it derived, as far as I know, from the Venetian merchants. They, they figured out that, is, that it is not necessary for them to travel with the goods. Mm -hmm. It's more comfortable for them to stay at home mm -hmm. and let their captains ship the goods. Mm -hmm. But they needed something like a guarantee that they really did ship the goods to the importing party. And so they invented uh, the document of Bill of Lading or similar documents where the captain issued that they delivered the goods to the importing party. Okay, cool. So it's a ledger, right? Yeah. In that, in yeah. that way. Yeah, and in now, way. So how did you come into this specific topic then and then blockchain as well? Because there are two specific topics in a way, right? Yeah, uh, I studied law in Hamburg, as I mentioned. And in Hamburg, we got the opportunity to specialize into maritime law. Okay. 
this is due to uh, the big harbor we have here. And we have specific uh, legal experts at the university that offer this uh, specialization in maritime trade. Mm -hmm. And at one point, we came across the letter of credit business. The letter of credit business, I can explain it briefly, is uh, something that is needed to guarantee the export. It's a matter of export finance in mm -hmm. a way. Um, banks guarantee that the goods were actually shipped and there's need something as a security. And so this bill of lading that is a receipt for the taking over of the goods can be used as a security for the export finance process. Because in this bill of lading, the, the goods are represented. Okay, cool. So you know, so you see that's a lawyer talking, like he's got all the special terms, but we all even un all understand them. That's, that's the magic of David. Um, let me just elaborate that for a moment. I heard him uh, speak first at the Hanseatic Blockchain Institute here in Hamburg. And it was a really cool speech uh, because he didn't uh, do it in a dry way like most lawyers do. And he wasn't only from Hamburg and into the maritime economy, which of course, since I'm from Hamburg, I'm fond of. But he also explained blockchain in a really cool way. And uh, I must admit, um, I stole a term from him and always use it. That's compliant programming. I credit that to him. It's a cool term. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> but I, I stole that. So that's I always wanted David on the, to come on the uh, podcast, and now we made it. So, okay, that explain how you got into the maritime economy and your interest into the bill of lading. But how did you step into blockchain then? Yeah, when I work at the law firm in Bremen, we tried to organize a big conference in maritime law because my old um, law company there uh, is part of the Bremen Forschungsverbund Maritimes Recht. Sorry for the German word here, folks. Oh, good. Um, yeah, and uh, in, it's a two year, every two years, there's a conference on maritime law in general. Mm -hmm. And in 2017, the main topic was electronic documents of trade. That mm -hmm. was the main topic. Okay. And since I was a scientific research associate in this law firm, it was my part to organize the company and find out what trends we have, how digitization could affect electronic documents of trade mm -hmm. and so on and so on. And then to be honest, it was the typical uh, midnight in a pub idea that came up to my mind. <laughs> cool. Yeah, it's like an afterwork thing because I worked on um, the legislation on the, uh, electronic trade in Germany and parallel I read the newspaper about the Bitcoin hype. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that got me interested into Bitcoin and blockchain technology. And at some point after work, when we had two or three beers, not too much because I was able to think. So. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I thought, well, we have a distributed ledger technology that enables the transfer of value. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, we have trade documents that deliver value in a way. And there must be a way to yeah, put these two aspects together. That is how I got into blockchain, actually. Okay, so that is how your interest uh, was made awake by into blockchain and then what happened then what did you do and what are you currently doing yeah after that it took a long time to yeah a really long time because then i had to figure out how my legal profession and technology could be put together mm -hmm. but then i found out about certain parts of the german commercial code mm -hmm. that allows electronic documents of trade electronic securities really yeah, yeah. they do they so germany's advanced in that in the legislation yeah very advanced can you just tell us a little thing oh yeah of course yeah uh, in 2013 the rotterdam rules yeah failed the rotterdam rules just for the the people not familiar with the maritime yeah. law was an attempt of harmonizing the international mar maritime law okay but they failed due to several reasons, mainly because the United States of America didn't want to ratify them for political reasons. Okay. But in these maritime rules, we had this uh, legislational attempt of functional equivalence. Okay. Functional equivalence basically means if you have any technology you want mm -hmm. that is able to um, create the functions of its analog predecessor, you can use it. Okay. And the German legislator liked the idea so much that they put this into the German commercial code in 2014. Wow. 
So since 2014, we have a totally functional regime for electronic securities in trade. Wow. Do other people know about that? <laughs> Unfortunately not. And this is also a reason why I'm here today, because I want uh, to put this information in, into the world. Because many people, even the people involved in maritime trade, do not know about it. Wow. And this was kind of the, the opening idea for me to put technology and law together. So what I did then was preparing something like an expose for my PhD thesis yeah. that combined maritime trade documents or electronic trade documents and blockchain. And then I, it took me six months or more than 50 application letters to find a professor that would help me with preparing my PhD thesis. More than 50? More than 50. But um, you had that endurance to do that? Yes. Wow. Yeah. I wanted to uh, obtain the PhD. That was something I ever... I, I knew I had to do if I... Cool. Uh, and in the end, I got three acceptance letters in a way. And the one was from my, from my professor right now, from Professor Dr. Jürgen Teger at okay. the University at Oldenburg. Yeah. Uh, and he has no idea about... had no idea about maritime trade. But he is a data protection law specialist. Ah, okay. And he organizes a big conference, one of the biggest conferences we have here in Germany okay. in IT and law. Mm -hmm. It's the Herbst Akademie of the Deutsche Stiftung für Recht und Informatik. Yeah. Maybe we can put the link to it. In Absolutely, the we will. Yeah, yeah um, we will. So you can check out. It has. Uh, it is the 21st version that we have this year cool. in, in Oldenburg. Uh, it's unfortunately the last one with my professor because he's retiring. Okay. Um, up to 65 speakers and more than 355 visitors. So, wow. So really big conference, mainly data protection, but a lot of technology yeah. and, uh, and stuff going on. Cool. So he knew about blockchain and law. And he found it really interesting that now I have a special use case for blockchain and law. And this is why he came up with the idea that I could uh, prepare my PhD thesis at the University of Oldenburg. He offered me a position there uh, as a research associate. And so we started. The reason why I'm here today goes even further than that. Wow. Because okay. at some point he, t he told me, well, what you are doing right now is looking from a legal perspective on how to build a technology. Yeah. But why not building a technology? Yeah. And this is, the, this is what, what he told me. Why not build the technology? Yeah. And, and at that, that moment, that was in 2018, at the beginning of 2018, 18, there was a funding round yeah. from the Ministry of Economical Affairs, yeah. uh, Smart Data Economy or something like that. Yeah. That was offered. And they gave us the opportunity of creating technology with blockchain and it has had a little legal aspect in it. So we applied for it. Okay. So he encouraged us to, to apply for it. Uh, we gathered the team at the University of Oldenburg yeah. containing of lawyers or legal experts, uh, developers. Uh, another institute from Oldenburg, the Office uh, Institute that also deals with IT in any cases. And the logistics company, Schenker okay. AG, yeah. the daughter of the Deutsche Bahn. So it's a big company. Yeah, a big company in our consortium. Yeah. And then we applied for this, uh, for this funding round. And we managed to get 1.4 million euros wow. for developing a fully compliant software. Fully and, compliant. Under your lead? Under my lead. Wow. Yeah. And you, you see guys as a lawyer leading yeah. a consortium to create a new technical solution. Yeah. Keep that in mind, lawyers out there. Yeah. And this is uh, actually where this compliant programming comes, yeah. comes, okay. comes into force. Because this is what you need then. If you are leading a project as a lawyer, well, I have to make that clear. Of course, my boss is the, is the leader of the project. But I am, since I have the maritime background, I have all the... Sure. The, um, the, the knowledge. The, the knowledge here yeah. for leading the project. But in fact, you need something like compliant programming because yeah. if you develop a software that is not compliant you're not allowed to use it i mean that's uh, probably that's a subject in itself compliant programming i mean we could do a whole podcast about it because it's basically i think 
isn't it like the idea where if you first develop the software and then try to make it compliant after, or if you make it compliant from the beginning, right? And that's your, the, lady, the second is your approach, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. The second is your approach. Because if, if, you, if, you, choose, if you choose the first way, the yeah. waterfall method. Waterfall method, water okay. Method, yeah. where, where you just program or develop your software um, following uh, the product backlog that derive from the business aspects and the technolo technological aspects, you will have a functional software and then you give the software to your legal department and I bet that the legal department, whoever that is, will say no. Yeah. Will say, they will say yeah. no. The, the bad lawyers come into gay uh, play and are the evil guys who yeah. make everything yeah. a trouble. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. We are the ones, we are the brakes. We are the brakes, right. right. In yeah. the process. Yeah. And in the end, well, you end up uh, maybe just quitting the project itself, which would be really bad or not not way better you will have to develop the software again a second time yeah and then probably a third time and probably a fourth time if the lawyers are not able to say what they need yeah what what the legislation needs yeah and this is very important for me it's to up to the lawyers and the legal aspects to make clear what legislation requires because the developers cannot understand the law without our help. We are yeah. we are something like the legal translation office. Yes. Good. The, Good point. Yeah, this I is like. what this is what we have to do. We have to be really clear and specific in in the requirements the software needs. Wow. Uh, that uh, but that uh, meant for me that I had to learn agile methods. Yeah. I had to learn how to write users or we our whole team had to learn how to write user stories. Who who is the team? Can you elaborate on that? Like who's in your team? Yes, of course. Um in overall we are up to seven people. Yeah. Um well, it's my person, then we have uh, Thomas Janiski, who is a data protection okay. uh, uh, specialist, yeah. who, who also published some papers about data protection and blockchain. Cool. Then uh, we have uh, my dearest colleague from the IT office, Stefan Wunderlich, who is um, who was responsible for um, doing all the stuff for the funding. Yeah. And is now our front end developer, yeah. if you want so. Uh, then we have Hauke Brecht, uh, Brecht our full stack <laughs> blockchain back end developer. Cool. <laughs> He sounds like uh, the. The technical mastermind. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. The, the Q of a team, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, I like him so much because, and, and all the other ones uh, too, but Hauke is the one that explains technology to me. Okay, that cool. Is, that, and I really enjoy these days when we just sit in the office and talk. And, and he stands on stands in front of me writing things on the board to explain me, <laughs> the dummy in wow. the team, and yeah. how the technology works. And that, that is so fun. And so Wow. That's what I always say. We need collaboration between technicians and the IT experts and the lawyers on the other hand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's super necessary. And it's, it's super exhausting in a way because both of the uh, disciplines, technical and law disciplines, um, have to learn the mindset of the other Uh, discipline, vice yeah. versa, but it's super interesting to learn that. Uh, besides that, we have our uh, Jule Stabel in the team. Jule Stabel is based in the mar maritime industry. Okay. Um, she's our, if you want, our contact into the industry. Okay. Uh, then we have um, uh, Sibylle Fröschle, which works for Office, which is our, who is okay. our uh, IT security specialist. Because there's a lot of IT security in identity management, PKI infrastructure, KYC processes. That, okay. is, all, that is all her business. Okay. And that is basically the team. Yeah. Cool. So it's a team of lawyers and technicians yeah. and like somehow a little bit marketing managers. Like yeah, yeah. And um, spe branch specialists. Branch, branch specialists. Yeah. Okay. So and what did you learn in this project and where is it currently? At what, what point? Well, the first thing I learned is, as a lawyer, you have to listen. Yeah. That is, uh, to be honest, that is the biggest lesson I learned, that as a lawyer, I have to listen a lot. Yeah. And read a lot to understand what the technology means and how the technicians work and the developers think. And probably that's not always easy because um, for David, it's not a problem. And I'm always always teaching my team that you win the most by listening to people. But a lot of lawyers have the tendency to come into the room and tell everybody what has to be done because 
they know the rules and the other and they are the referee and tell the people how to play the game and with technology it's a little bit different i think right yeah, yeah but on the other hand you have to make you have to stand your ground yeah. you have to make clear okay. that the, if the legislation requires some aspects they must be implemented into the technology yeah and this is also really hard because you have to make your point understandable yeah as what i said in the beginning you have to uh, understand the law of course and then make it understandable for the technicians so that's yeah. the second biggest lesson i learned and the third lesson i learned is that it is not only about it and law but also about the branch you're in yeah and the maritime industry or the logistics industry in general is a really traditional industry mm -hmm. where technology is not seen as a savior, but more or less like a threat. Okay. This is mainly the reason why the paperwork is still going on, because many people are working on the documents. They trust the documents. The documents, yeah. yeah. And we have to build up trust into technology. I understand. Cool. So where's the project now? Yeah, what we did in the last year, the project uh, officially began in 2019. Mm -hmm. First of January was the start. In uh, August, we got the fund. August 2018, we got the, the goal that the funding uh, is set. Yeah. Uh, what we did in the last year was three things. Mainly, of course, legal thinking. Yeah. Because the legal thinking must be done at first to have this compliant programming uh, thing from the very beginning on. So this is what we did and we finished. Mm -hmm. That means personally for me, I finished my PhD thesis. Wow, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very well, much. Is it true? You're, you're a full doctor right now? No, it's not. not? Unfortunately not. Okay. Uh, but I handed it in and uh, now I'm waiting for uh, a date for the defense. Okay, good. Cool. So uh, hopefully it's in April, but let's see. Okay, okay. Let's we'll see. cross our fingers for you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, it's not only the PhD we publish, but we uh, I think overall we published nearly 30 papers. Mm -hmm. uh, let it be 25, I don't know exactly, about blockchain law and maritime trade in general mm -hmm. to put our ideas into the world. Okay. Because as you saw before, yeah. nobody knows. What nobody ideas. knows. Nobody no. knows. And this is something we have to change. And this is uh, actually the big, one of the biggest parts and also my personal part in the project is marketing. Marketing. Yeah, yeah. Marketing in a way that uh, we have to get this idea into the world of logistics. Yeah. Um, this is what we did the last year. I come, I come to that point later on because uh, we did a lot of technical stuff too. Yeah. And that is a cool thing. If you have a big team, then everybody can do his part full time. And at the end of the year, you can see what you achieved in all the areas. Yeah. Um, so we evaluated lots of different uh, blockchain implementation. Um, because we didn't know in the beginning if we should use Ethereum, Hyperledger, or R3 Corda, or yeah. whatever. Uh, so there was a lot of technical evaluation going on with the legal aspects in mind. And then we decided for one and built the first test testing network at the yeah. servers at the university, which took more time than we thought it would be because the blockchain technology is a network based technology totally and yeah. if you if you build a network a virtual network it it also it every every time there's something going on uh, new bugs uh, popping <laughs> up. and I, actually i really admit my colleagues that they are so yeah how do i say they're so cool with all the bugs popping yeah. up i would freak out every time if I see for it. them it's daily business yeah, right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we built up the test network. We filled our product backlog with, I would say, 150 user stories. Wow. Yeah, and uh, now we start uh, coding the, um, uh, the the logic, the smart contract itself okay. on top of the blockchain. And we have the front end uh, set, main, main idea of the front end, front end set. And we have the PKI infrastructure ideas all set. And... We hope, we hope, um, I have to say hope because I don't want to uh, put too much time pressure on the team, yeah. that we will have a first prototype ready in April or May. Wow, that's, that's cool. Uh, Pitch it to us. Tell, let us assume I'm working in the maritime economy mm -hmm. and you want to pitch us to us your project your product tell yeah. us what are the benefits yeah sure yeah the benefit are is that we have a fully dis distributed ledger yeah that contains all the information of the bl yeah bill of lading uh, bill, bill of lading yeah uh, the document that we try to digitize and is accessible 24 7 okay 
So right now there's a big problem that if somebody doesn't hold the BL in his hands, he doesn't know whether uh, what what is in the yeah. BL. And on the other hand, if the BL is not at the port of discharge, yeah, the goods cannot be handed over. So like I arrive, for example, in China, mm -hmm. and if I don't have the BL with me, then I don't get the stuff in China. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And with technology, you don't have this issue before. Uh, again. I'm, again, because again. I... Like I put out, take out my smartphone, and the bill of lading is on it. Yeah, and that is exactly what we what what we build right now. And, and I mean, that's such an obvious use case for distributed ledger technology because it's a ledger that's digitized and it runs through many hands. We all got to trust the ledger, so it sounds like wow. That is like the definition of blockchain in a way, right? Yeah, exactly. The whole process of trade or supply chain is a, a consortium, actually. Yeah. Because what you need is a, a, um, an exporter and an Im importer. You need carriers and shippers. You need yeah. guaranteeing banks. You need insurance companies that guarantee that the transport uh, uh, um, damages are covered. And, and all this, it's, it's a team of people. It's, it's somehow co-opetition in a way. Many, yeah. ma many people working together on the same goal but everyone taking his own share out of it yeah and what we do is putting all these parties involved on the blockchain yeah giving them a node if they want to okay so they have full data sovereignty yeah and then they could deal with the processes well wow. that is what we what we try to do so and the parties involved are who are the parties involved yeah uh, as i said uh, we have the exporting and importing party yeah. the logistics integrator the shipping yeah. uh, companies then the carriers itself that own the the ships and transfer the goods uh, the companies the port uh, industry that uh, does the loading process Uh, the banks, the, yeah. the export financing banks, um, the P&I clubs, so the protection and identity, insuring companies, and custom authorities. Wow. So there are many players, right? Yeah, many players. And do you think um, that you can make those players accept blockchain? What, what would they need on a regulatory level or on a change of mind level? What, do you, what would we need for that? Yeah, it's the the cool thing here is we don't need to change a regulatory. Okay, because we all got it got there. Yeah, we, yeah. We, we under German law we have everything set, and I mentioned customs law. If you look at the European customs code, yeah, it said or everything must be digitized. Yeah, okay. Must be, so it's, so it's open for blockchain. It's all set, and the the cool thing is we don't only have the the transportation law. Yeah, we don't only have the customs law, but also the export financing law. Yeah, the unified uh, rules for letters of credit. That is for the banks. Right? That is for the banks. Yeah, also has an amendment, the electronic uniform rules for yeah. and customs for uh, letters of credit that allow the usage of electronic documents. See, that's for example. I before, of course, when I uh, now I know it, but I didn't he know it before I heard your speech at the Hanseatic Blockchain Institute mm. because. Everybody's always saying we need to change our laws so that they open up for a digitized world. But in this case, it is open for a digitized world. It's just like for the practical world to accept it now and to use it, right? Exactly. Yeah. So, wow, that's, that's a big project. But what, what, what do you need? What, where is it heading? What, what are you going to do with it? Now it's on university level. Will it stay at university level? It will stay at the university level until the end of 2021. Okay. But um, since it is a project that also has the aim of doing something further, we try to fund the company. Yeah. At the moment, we okay. try to, to get this technology on track after the project ends. Okay. Uh, and on the governance level, we do not want to found like a, a solemn capital based company, but we, we want to have this cooperation aspect on the governance level, this consensus uh, mechanism. mechanism, this decentralized mechanism of the blockchain. We want to have that on the governance level as well. Which means what exactly? That we are going for a cooperation. Okay. Yeah. So like, When investors want to come in, or you probably want um, companies from the maritime economy to jump in, exactly. right? Exactly. We want the stakeholders represented in the real-life process 
also being part of the cooperation of our blockchain company. Yeah. Wow, cool. And so this is a call out already then for anybody listening and interested? Yeah, that is a call out. Yeah. Uh, contact me. We are always looking for partners that, that believe in our idea, that want to go the way of cooperation in maritime trade with us. And we believe that it is the right way because uh, we are not the only one trying to digitize the bill of lading. We are the only ones trying to digitize the bill of lading under German law and making it fully legally compliant. Yeah. But there are many big players uh, um, also working on the same topic. We have this EPM and Maersk, yeah. Trade Venture, Tradelands. Yeah. Uh, we have ESS Docs uh, working on it. We have the the old and famous Bolero organization that is more than 30 years or 25 years old working on electronic uh, bills of lading. But as you can hear from me saying, they are at, even if they are using blockchain technology, they are from a governance level centralized. Yeah. And of course, Maersk has competitors. So probably what Maersk develops, the competitors won't use, right? In a way? Exactly. In a way. Yeah. yeah. And because it's a centralized approach, and we believe that all the centralized approach, being it from a technical perspective centralized or from a governance level centralized, will fail because they cannot gain trust. Wow. But, and, and I mean, you come from a university, mm -hmm. you come from a public funded project. So everybody knows you don't have any commercial players behind you at this point who's, who's, who are pushing you into one direction. Like yeah. you, you do it to say it in a way, in a neutral way, like yeah. to find out what's the best for everyone, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. It's, wow. uh, and also our, we have a big company in our back because yeah. we have Schenker working yeah. with us, but Schenker follows the idea of a new idea of a neutral approach 110%. Because they are working with so many players themselves, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. But that is why, that, that is what the logistics and supply chain requires working with many players. What do you follow the general uh, development of uh, supply chain on log uh, in logistics, not only in maritime economy, but in other economies too? And what, what do you see? Do you think that blockchain will really push through supply chain? Yeah. Yeah. I think supply chain is the use case in general for blockchain. Can you elaborate that a little? Yeah, of course. Um, I can... Um I can point at a uh, something the Federal Ministry for Transport yeah. um, issued l last year in 2019. It was in May 2019. Yeah. They issued a um, paper a paper on blockchain and logistics. Okay. Uh, 250 pages uh, paper, super cool paper. Yeah. That yeah, super cool paper because they had all the three aspects in mind: having the technology in mind, having the legal aspects in mind, and uh, having the logistics sector yeah. in mind. And they came to the conclusion, as I said before, that logistics and blockchain goes, well. goes hand to hand. They they mentioned not only the digital trade documentation but also platooning. Platooning? Uh, yeah, platooning is um, when you link uh, many trucks together, yeah. uh, more or less coincidentally, yeah. to, um, oh, how should I explain it in short words, it's not my, not, not my piece of cake, but um, platooning is many trucks riding in the same direction, yeah. and therefore profiting because they are all going in the same direction. They yeah. can exchange their goods, uh, travel uh, okay. in, uh, in the wind shadow and, yeah. and things like that. Okay. Uh, if somebody listens, um, explain it better to us next episode. Absolutely. Yeah. You're invited. If you yeah. know, if you can, I, I mean, I already have an idea, but if there's a platooning expert mm -hmm. out there, send me an email and you're on the show. Uh, uh, and there are also other aspects. Um, um, if we look at crowd logistics. Yeah where we use um, uh, inhabitants of big cities uh, okay. as uh, micro hubs. Yeah. If you, I don't know, have 10 packages. Man, yeah, I know. Uh, and I, to have the, the, the cash uh, being represented yeah. uh, that they earn uh, with the ledger. And of course, provenance, one of the biggest aspects. Yeah. Provenance, tra tracking and tracing uh, things wow. uh, are super interesting. And, uh, take a look at the paper of the... Uh, the federal ministry I will. Is, super is super interesting cool uh, um, because the legal aspects are uh, really they, are, they did a really good job there only available in German or also in English they have an English management summary very good yeah. um, so probably we'll put that in the notes of this episode yeah. so yeah. that people can download it yeah. cool exactly. and 
wow, cool project. I find that really still a fascinating use case. And of course, the combination of your team of lawyers, developers working together and, and uh, field specialists in the maritime economy, that of course is something quite unique, especially with the approach of compliant programming, which is still a super cool term that everybody should use, I think, and credit you. Um, that's a unique thing. And what do you personally think? Where, where are you heading? Are you, is that the field you're going to work in for the next years? What are What will drive you in the future still? Yeah, actually, I love the maritime industry. Yeah. I love it so much beca because it is so traditional. Yeah. Because we are in Hamburg here. We have yeah. this Hansa thing. Yeah. And in the maritime industry, the Hansa still lives in a way. It's, cool. It's, you can trust the people you're working with. You feel that if somebody gives you a handshake, he means it. Yeah. And this is something I really admire. And and on the other hand, I like the sea. I like sailing. I like water sports. Uh, and this makes work also a bit easier. Cool. So I, so I really try to stay in maritime industry. Um, but on the other hand, I like this whole digitization thing. I like to disrupt traditional industries. That, 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 that is a cool thing for me. I'm 27 right now and I talk to uh, people from big companies about how they could change their business they made for the last 200 years. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing times to live, right? Yeah, yeah that feels amazing and I'm, I'm so happy and, and thankful that I, that I got the opportunity. I have to thank my, my boss, Professor Teger, that he allows me to, to do this because, I mean, I I'm working at the university. Yeah. I'm working at the university and you could say, well, I'm preparing my PhD thesis in law, which is fun, but nothing special in a way. But, yeah. But we got the opportunity to make something special out of it. We organized a, a big conference in Hamburg on the digit, future maritime law, we called it. Okay. In, um, about all the topics that will disrupt maritime industry and maritime law in the next years, like we have autonomous ships electronic trade documentation, cybersecurity and cyber risks in insurance and so on and so on, platform economy. So I feel there's, a, there's many things to do. And if there are international listeners here, we have a workshop going on on the 30th and 31st of March in mm -hmm. Edinburgh. In Edinburgh. About blockchain and, cool. uh, and international trade. So yeah. if you're interested, you're invited to join us. And we'll put, of course, that link in the notes too. Yeah. Cool. We will do that. David, it was such a pleasure to have you on the show. Yeah, thank you very much. How can people reach you? Uh, on LinkedIn. Yeah. Just type my name on yeah. Twitter. But I think LinkedIn is the best uh, it is. media to just, just add me, write me a short uh, uh, message. And I'm really happy to answer it and answer all the questions you have. Thank you so much for your time and we'll have you back in the future to know, to keep track of what's going on with you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you want to learn more about Dennis, please visit his website, theblockchain.lawyer, or connect with him on LinkedIn or Twitter. Until next time, everyone. 